matters. Uh, one matter is a small one which I will deal later, uh, which took place this morning with regards to Tansri uh, Sharil uh, issue, but that is a smaller matter. But the main matter that I want to inform you, and I think we owe you an obligation uh, to tell you of the development in the case of Datuk Sri Najib's uh, uh, quest uh, to fight for his case and to get released. Uh, we have just filed only hours ago, about 1.30, we have just filed um, a petition to the United Nations. Okay, we have filed this in Geneva by way of uh, digital transmission. We have done it at uh, 1.30. And uh, this is a document uh, in the form of a petition by Dato Sri Najib uh, personally uh, through us, the council. This is entitled Communication to the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. Uh, we file it at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, which is uh, addressed in Geneva, and this was done today on 5th January 2023. Uh, the title of that complaint will obviously be Datuk Sri Muhammad Najib bin Haji Abdul Razak versus Malaysia. All right, versus Malaysia because we're taking the country to the United Nations because we are saying that the country has failed in not giving Datuk Sri Najib the fair trial that he deserves. Now, I want to read the press release first. Um, Datuk Sri Muhammad Najib bin Haji Abdul Razak, the former Prime Minister of Malaysia, today brought a petition before the United Nations Human Rights Council Working Group on Arbitrary Detention uh, acronym as UNWGAD to ask for a release or a retrial following an appeal hearing at the federal court which had serious defects and was contrary to the rules of international justice. He is asking the UNWJAD panel of five experts, five legal experts, on international justice to rule that the dismissal of his appeal by the federal court on the 23rd August 2022 was unjust, flawed and violated his basic human rights and the federal constitution. The federal court proceedings failed to accord him a reasonable opportunity to argue his case and denied his lawyers adequate time to prepare it, as you can appreciate. Now. He, he asked for two to three months or three to four months because of the change of lawyers. He was not given that. The court did not allow his defence team even to make submissions in the appeal against his sentence of 12 years imprisonment. In essence, Najib had been sent to jail without the opportunity to defend himself at the federal court. The final few days of the appeal in August amounted to a rushed justice when his lawyers were not allowed the time that was obviously needed to read the many tens of thousands of pages of the appeal papers or to come to grips with the 94 grounds of appeal that his previous lawyers had filed. The previous lawyers meaning Shafi and Co. Then it was taken over by Zaid Ibrahim and, 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 and company. Yeah? The UNWGAD, which will hear the appeal, comprises of five distinguished human rights judges. They will not be called upon to decide whether Najib is guilty or not, but to determine whether his trial was fair and if not, may call upon the government to release him or provide him with a retrial of the appeal at the federal court or a retrial completely from the High Court itself. Although this decision is not directly binding, it is very influential, especially, especially as Malaysia has a distinguished jurist 
who is currently a member of the working group. So we got one Malaysian in that particular working group who is a distinguished jurist. Uh, but just to be complete, she may disqualify herself because she's from Malaysia. But she may not. She may not. It, it, it all depends on whether there is a, a question of conflict. Some of the UNWG's strongest advocates, and this may surprise you, yeah, include the current Prime Minister of Malaysia, Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim, who has told the Cambridge University Press some time ago huh, that, and I want to quote what he said, I felt a renewed sense of hope that the wheels of justice are still churning where UNWJAD's opinion was, and I quote again, an important milestone on my journey to freedom. This was stated by Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim himself over his predicament from the first uh, case that he had uh, in the courts in Malaysia. As the beneficiary of a ruling from UNWGAD, Datuk Sri Najib expresses the hope and confidence that the current government will follow the UNWGAD's ruling upon the same being made available in due course. Okay? That is the official statement. You have a copy of the written version. Um, I want to uh, just highlight a few things. <coughs> I can't provide you this. Uh, this is the actual petition and it is supported uh, by a bundle of documents which is exhibited. This will be the bundle of documents, bundle of exhibits that will go with this. In fact, all this has been filed today. Now, this, uh, we call it the communication uh, to the working group on arbitrary detention. I just want to highlight a few things. And I think it is important that you know, and you may want to ask me questions uh, after this. Now, you remember, uh, the episode at the federal court became not satisfactory as far as we are concerned. In fact, as far as any human rights lawyer worth his sob is concerned, what happened in the federal court is most unsatisfactory. Now, there was a change of solicitors and counsel, no doubt, about, uh, about five weeks uh, before uh, the commencement of the appeal, which was to start sometime in, uh, was it in October? No, August, in August, 15 August, uh, somewhere. Now, the lawyers, the new lawyers have convinced Datuk Sri Najib, and this is because they hold that honest view that with the change of lawyers suddenly, for purposes of getting uh, a, a second view or prospect of the case, uh, they would uh, be able to get the adjournment because nobody could prepare a case of that massive amount of documents within five weeks. There's no way you can even finish reading the document. Now, so when they appeared, the new lawyers appeared from the first day itself, they have indicated earlier that they were going to, they were going to ask for adjournment for three to four months. They were refused. All right? The court refused. Mind you, this is the first time ever an adjournment request was made at the federal court by Datuk Sri Nadi. He has never asked for adjournment. And you must know, there are many cases you have appeared in the federal court. Whenever an accused said, I have changed counsel, give me time to look for a new counsel. He never even said that I've got counsel, but my counsel need time to prepare. Even in a situation where he said, I have changed counsel today, give me time, I want to, to get a new counsel, court has never, and you can take it from me, you can record it, the court has never said no. Okay? Now here is a case where Datuk Sri Najib said, I've engaged new bunch of lawyers five weeks ago, there's no way they can prepare and argue this matter, I want an adjournment, the lawyer said they need the adjournment in order to be effectively preparing for the appeal. They were denied this adjournment. Alright? 
that goes squarely against the United Nations guidelines, namely the right to counsel, means you must have counsel that is effective. No point having counsel sitting there, like what happened in this case. Counsel said, I cannot argue because I have not read, there was no opportunity to read. The federal court ordered the counsel to sit there throughout the session without him contributing a single word. Okay? So, to us, this is a, a, a fundamental breach of human rights. Now, um, yeah. and this is not just international law on human rights. Our law in the constitution itself, under Article 5, says, Article 5 on liberty, uh, freedom uh, 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 and, and, and liberty, demands that fair trial be also accorded to any accused person. And this is this, is, has, this has already been uh, um, uh, subscribed to in view by the federal court in several cases. So our own law says you must give him the right uh, to a counsel, the right to a fair trial. Now you remember um, in the federal court there was a case involving uh, a Yemeni student uh, who was defended uh, in somewhere in Tawa. Uh, I became the subsequent counsel, but the lawyer who defended him actually has never defended a single case on drug trafficking. And he was actually dying of cancer. For some reason, I don't know why, he took the case and he didn't complete it. He died midway. And, and the poor Yemeni student was not defended well. The federal court held that that was not an effective uh, engagement of counsel because the counsel was not effective therefore the right to counsel was deprived that was a case where actual argument was made but not effective it was in fact a very shoddy argument and the federal court said that the right to counsel was deprived and they ordered a kind of retrial back to the, to the high court second point I want to uh, tell you is this there was no allegation that Datuk Sri Najib, neither the prosecution nor the court, make any allegation that Datuk Sri Najib uh, attempted to do a ploy to get an adjournment. This was not a ploy to get an adjournment. Nobody has accused him of that. Neither did they accuse the new lawyers. In the context of there being no accusation that this was a ploy to adjourn, we feel that uh, were, uh, taking into consideration that just a few weeks earlier uh, his request to get uh, a leading Queen's Council by the name of Jonathan Laidlaw that was, de that was denied by the High Court so his change of counsel to get a second view was reasonable if that was reasonable you must give him the uh, opportunity to get his counsel to be prepared but thirdly, what is shocking is this. The court in the judgment, the federal court in their judgment, which is just two, three pages, blame the, the, the lawyers. You see, you shouldn't have accepted uh, this case if you were not ready. So they blame the lawyers. Now, what has the lawyers got to do with Datuk Sri Najib? Datuk Sri Najib is the victim. He is the one who suffers. Even assuming the lawyers were wrong to, to have misjudged that the court would grant an adjournment, why do you punish Datuk Sri Najib? That is a fundamental breach of human rights. Because a lawyer's fault must not be taken against the, the, his client. Now, to some of you who have attended that proceeding, you may realize that as soon as conviction was made, they could have confirmed conviction, without hearing Datuk Sri Najib's counsel, eh? because they, they, they were not prepared, they couldn't. Although Datuk Sri Najib's counsel could not submit, the court said, Nema, you sit there, let's hear the other side. The other side has to reply. But they reply to what? They replied to nothing because this council here has not spoken. So there is a double jeopardy. One is you don't allow him to speak because he was not prepared. Second is 
he did not speak and you allowed the other side to reply and making the situation even worse than before. Okay, this is why we say there is a fundamental breach of human rights. Now, after conviction was confirmed, those of you who are familiar with court proceeding, you will know that you have to invite counsel to address on sentence because the appeal is on la conviction and sentence. There was no invitation at all by the federal court. I think they forgot totally that there is uh, an appeal on, on sentence as well. So no uh, uh, invitation to submit on the sentence. And that's another fundamental breach. In fact, it is the biggest uh, breach that, that, that can occur in any criminal procedure. Because whether it is 12 years or it could be 5 years, all that depends on the right to mitigate. And whether the 400 and, uh, no, 210 uh, million, you remember in this case, there's a 210 million fine. And we would have argued, if we were the council, but we were not then, yeah? That the 210 million fine was totally wrong in law because it is not mandatory. But the judge thought it was mandatory. The first judge thought it was mandatory. Court of Appeal uh, 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 just approved it, and the federal court never heard anything and approved it. Then we have, we have quoted various uh, provisions of the UDHR, uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, that was passed in 1948 when we became part of the United Nations, uh, we adopted UDHR. We are not a member of ICCPR. ICCPR is also part of the United Nations, uh, International Covenant uh, for Civil and Political Rights. Although we are not members, ICCPR and UDHR have got almost identical provision. So when this body, this working group consider uh, the breaches, they will consider both almost uh, concurrently. All right. Now, first we say uh, the uh, refusal to adjourn means that the right to counsel of his choice was deprived of him. Second, under Article 14, we are saying the general rule is requiring a fair hearing, like our Article 5. That was also denied to Datu Sri Najib. Then Article 14, bracket 2, is the presumption of innocence, which, we, which is also part of our law. When the federal court took that stance, then I'm not going to adjourn this matter. And it resulted in what was feared most, that they rushed through the proceeding and confirmed the conviction that presumption of innocence was discarded by the federal court. That is against Article 14, bracket 2. Now, Article 14, bracket 3b for Bravo, denial of adequate time and facilities to prepare the defence is also a serious breach. All right? Now, uh, this part of, of it, there are many authorities. All these part, uh, the cases that I've quoted to you, uh, the various rights that I've quoted to you, they are cases in the United Nations that are reported. One such case is a case called Nashid versus Maldives. Yeah, opinion number 33 of 2015, where they agreed to this principle. There are many others. You remember the, uh, the recent president of Brazil, Mr. Lula, Sorry, he's currently the president. Yeah, he got sworn in last week. He was in the prison, convicted for uh, corruption, but there were so many breaches. He filed to the same body. All right, and the United Nations Working Group advised Brazil to release him because there were so much breaches uh, in the right to a fair trial and so on and so on. Almost the same sort of provisions that we have raised here. Brazil initially did not follow the advice, which they shouldn't. They have to. They have to follow the advice. But what happened was, as a result of the strong opinion from the United Nations, the court in Brazil reviewed the conviction of Mr. Lula and released him in time for him to stand for election for the president of uh, Brazil.
So, if you ask me, is this effective remedy? The answer is yes. Although it is not uh, what they call it binding, but you remember we had Privy Council before. Privy Council before, we had Privy Council in England. It is also advisory. Technically, it is not uh, binding. But no Malaysian government has ever said we are not following it. They always follow it because if you don't follow it, there are consequences diplomatic in nature as well as various other consequences uh, that has got international repercussions to Malaysia. Yeah? Uh, investors will not want to come in and think that because you are not complying with human rights. And this is, if the United Nations say you are not complying with the human rights, then it, 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 it is best that the country follow the advice given by the United Nations. And uh, the last principle is of course, uh, sorry, the last two principles, there is no equality of arms. Equality of arms they are using the concept of war. Uh, if you have uh, this amount of, uh, uh, what do you call it, guns and cannons and whatnot, to be fair, the other side must have similar things. So we are talking about the court. If the prosecution is given that privilege when they were completely ready, the Datuk uh, Sinaji lawyers, the new lawyers were not ready, there is no equality of arms and therefore is a breach of a fair trial proceeding. And uh, the last one, of course, and this was quite shocking. The case in the federal court where they denied the appeal and they confirmed the conviction was nearly two pages, the judgment. All right? In the, in the high court, uh, it was 780 pages. In the court of appeal, it was about 350 pages. In the federal court, it was two pages. You know why? Because they never hear the argument of the merits of the appeal, the merits of the case. So what they did was they did a, a kind of judicial review. Judicial review is to see whether judges were, uh, were right or wrong in the way they make assessment. But that's not an appeal. In an appeal in the federal court, you do a rehearing of everything, facts as well as the law. The federal court failed to see the difference. So this is also a fundamental breach. All right, I don't want to bore you too much with the law, but that is a short summary of what we have sent uh, in this document that I've just show, uh, shown you. Any questions on on this uh, matter, please? How soon do you expect? Uh the UN Working Committee to reply to your session. Okay. They sit three times a year. Alright? And we are expecting the first sitting for 2023 to be very soon. And I'm told from a reliable source, they come back from New Year, Christmas, holidays only in you know, on the 9th. Okay, so they have got it today on the 5th. I'm sure by the time they got it, they will start processing it. The procedure is they will send this entire thing, it is not our duty. They will send it to the government of Malaysia through the diplomatic services, through our Wisma Putra, to be served on the Malaysian government so that the Malaysian government respond to our allegation. Alright? And then, if the Malaysian government respond, then they may ask us for further rebuttal and then they will decide. Very rarely do they invite counsel to appear before them. But it can happen, but very rarely. Alright? So, yeah, to answer you, I think is within a few months, they, 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 will, they will hear it. And how fast they make the decision, uh, I am not certain. Alright? Okay. Okay. The two things are separate, all right? The review is to invite the domestic tribunal, which is the next quorum of the federal court, to say that the first quorum, quorum was totally wrong. They did not uh, abide by the procedure, the constitutional uh, protection. They didn't do all these things. Um, uh, one of the uh, biggest points that we are going to, to show, apart from 
you didn't invite us to submit on, on, on sentence, is the fact that show me one case in Malaysia since 1957 or earlier where you did not give a journal when council had just been changed. How did you force uh, uh, somebody like uh, Datuk Sri Najib, forget about his status, he can be Awang or, uh, or Ahmad from the kampung, it doesn't matter. How dare you not give him the right to change his counsel and to be fully prepared? That is something that we, we address the domestic tribunal, namely the federal court, at the, at the review. Okay? But what we wrote to the, uh, uh, to the United Nations in Geneva is to take it to the international dimension because there is a breach of international human rights which is a, a standard that we subscribe to by being a member of the United Nations. No point being a member of the United Nations if you don't abide by your own uh, membership to the United Nations. This is a, a, a standard that is expected of civilized nations. Yeah, unless, unless we want to be called another banana republic, there's another story. Uh, so if you want to be considered as a game, uh, uh, as, as a player, uh, in the uh, international human rights uh, uh, concept, we have to behave the way the international standard has been prescribed. Mm. So that is an international dimension. But assuming on the 19th this matter goes on in the federal court and assuming we win, we will immediately write to the United Nations, the same uh, UN working group, to advise them that this is what happened, this is what has happened. Therefore, the remedy, in short, has been achieved. They may accommodate what is the latest uh, that has happened in their opinion to the Malaysian government. So it is not inconsistent. Yeah, same thing with Lula, same thing with Nasheed. All this we did. There are many Arab countries that have also resorted. Uh, to uh, United Nations with regards to individual rights, and they have won. All right? Yes, sir. Taking Lula as an example, in Lula there was there were two or three sets of hearing by the working group. The hearing meaning they, they don't hear people, but they they hear uh, the communication. They have made an interim opinion, not the final opinion. They made an interim opinion asking the Brazilian government to release Lula immediately so that he can participate in the election. Sending Lula to the prison by the uh, court in Brazil, uh, listen carefully, sound very familiar, was to deprive him from competing in the election. That's why they rushed and they bundled him up into prison. So, the United Nations body said, we give interim relief get him out, this is our advice, so that he can participate in the election, so that further human rights breaches will not occur. Then they came up with the final opinion. In Lula, of course, because he was very convoluted, yeah? Lula involved uh, an allegation of corruption, uh, famously known as the car wash, car wash scandal. Kita sini kita panggil SRC 1MDB. It's not a car wash scandal, but it's not car, car wash kind of uh, minuscule amount of money is, is also in billion. Yeah? But as you know, today uh, Lula is the president of uh, Brazil. So it, it was quite effective in that sense. Um, yes? Do you think by sending the position to United Nations, you have a chance to be released or returned? It gives him two chances instead of just one. So one is with the federal court, the other is with the uh, with the United Nations. Yes, sir. Uh, are we going to give sanction if nation 
Yes. Most definitely, the sanction can happen in 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 various format. It can be a silent uh, sanction because if you do not uh, abide by the United Nations advice, as I've said, why be the member at all? Why do you want to remain to be a member of the United Nations? Huh? Because we have subscribed to a prescribed mode of standard of. Uh, human rights. You see, you and I should be interested in this. Because one day you or I, chances are, uh, chances are it's me, not you, will get into similar trouble. So if you don't have an avenue uh, to complain about your own government, you're a dead duck. Okay? Uh, Dr. Yes. Uh, since you have mentioned in the press statement uh, the name of uh Prime Minister, would you be sending this petition uh, to, to lobby Dr. Uh, Sri Anwar, or has he been mentioned in that petition that you're giving to the Working Committee? Okay. Although nobody has ever sent to the government a copy, I suspect that Dr. Sri Anwar Ibrahim, when he sent a kind of similar uh, communication, he may not have sent it to the government because the United Nations will give to the government. But today, as we filed it, we also sent to the government of Malaysia. To whom? The International Division of the Attorney General's Yeah, the International Division of the Attorney General's Chambers has received it today. That is purely out of courtesy, not uh, compulsory. Would you be giving a copy to Dr. Sri Anwar personally? Well, that is something interesting. Uh, I, I certainly would... There is no downside to it. Uh, after all, he endorses uh, this body uh, very strongly because uh, there was some opinion expressed with regards to how he was treated in the prison when he was kept in the prison over the two occasions. Uh, so he, he found that there, there is credibility in this body. So certainly it is a good point that you have raised that we may just give it to him in the form of uh, a separate petition enclosing this. Okay, yeah, royal pardon. royal pardon, we you know we have given the royal pardon papers as early as um, as soon as he went in within within three weeks I think we have put in the royal pardon. I do not know the progress of the royal pardon because it is all hush hush, as you know. Uh, things like this, uh, they do not move openly, all right? But I must stress that the royal pardon should have moved so fast because our complaint is the first time in the history of Malaysia, maybe one of the very, very rare occasions in the world. We say, you please pardon my client because, not because he is now begging for mercy, because he has committed the crime. No. We are saying he has not committed the crime, but you pardon him because your own judiciary has not granted him a fair trial. So you better pardon him. Because if you don't give him, if a former Prime Minister never got a fair trial, what are your chances? Just think about it. A former Prime Minister never got a fair trial. What if you get into trouble? What are your chances? Correct. Within your statement, it says that the court did not allow his defense to even make submissions, which I have covered the thing from end to end. Right. That was not the case. What do you mean by that? Justice has, justice, the government has asked repeatedly for, 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 for lawyer to submit submissions. Right. He wished not to do so. Correct. Even asked whether to use your submissions. Right. And he denied to do so. Correct. So the court did allow him to make submissions. Correct. He did not make submissions. Can I ask you to demonstrate a simple question? Assuming you were Tisham Tepote, the new counsel, 
You have not read a single page because you have just been appointed. I am to go my moon, I ask you, submit. You cannot submit because you are not prepared. Is that, is that a true giving of a chance for you to submit? Or is that illusory? Is that a pretended right given to you? When I give you the right, that right must be able to be used by you. Not in a pretended way. Must be realistic. Right? That's what we're saying here. Therefore, there was a total breach of human right and, and, and a breach of natural justice. And clearly you were there. Was there any argument on the sentencing? Zero. It's a fundamental right. But why you only raise it now, like four or five months after he's gone in, to raise that how come you deny the right to submit on the sentence? Why uh, only now? What do you think the review was about? To deny the right to, to submit. The review is all about that as well. What about concerns uh, from Chief Justice that, you know, you know, this will set a precedent because others will keep changing, last minute changing their lawyers just to buy more time, you know? But you, you, you forgot, I've just said, with the exception of you, nobody said this was a ploy to delay. Nobody said in this case. And what more, the prosecution said, we have no objection to the adjournment. So what is it, the problem with the court to grant four, four, four months or three months or even two months adjournment? What is it that is biting the court that they cannot give it? In this case, you cannot give it. Other cases, we can give. Why? Think about it. I don't want to say it because I'm bordering on contempt, but think about it. Why the court didn't want to give? I think you have the answer. Patrick, so yes. uh, for the January 19th review hearing, is the, is the Tutri Najib going to go ahead with it or will you apply for postponement because you just filed it today? No, this has nothing to do with the 19th. As far as we are concerned, we can go ahead, but we have been told that there is a problem with the assembling of quorum because there is not enough judges. So 19 can go on, 20 and 26 cannot go on. As we know, this is an argument that will take more than three days. But we will see. But to answer your question, we are ready to go on the 19. Uh, are there any health reasons uh, on the Petri Najib that has been included in the petition? No. No, no health reason uh, included uh, because uh, whatever health reason that he had, although it was very cumbersome and delayed, uh, he finally managed to see uh, some of the doctors. Yeah, with the, uh, there was one episode that was life-threatening. Uh, I, think, I think you know about it, uh, where his uh, hemoglobin le level went down to 7 point something when he should have 17 on the average. Seven, you, you could just die. But he was lucky. So they put in, uh, they, 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 they uh, transfused blood uh, from some donors. I think about two, three pints of blood in order to save him. That happens. That, yeah. that was, I must correct, before he went into the prison. Meaning, even while in the best of care in his home, this was a slip. No, he didn't realize why he was tired. Because nowadays, you know, uh, sorry, I have, to, I have to say this. Nowadays, our toilets are modern. You go and sit in the toilet, you do your job, you don't even see what you have done, and you walk away. If you see what you have done is totally black, chances are it's black. Most of us do not even know. So he lost a lot of blood through the uh, various uh, issues that he had uh, in the oesophagus, in the stomach. He had a lot of ulcer. Uh, can this United Nations working group uh, refuse to accept or... No, they can't. Uh, are there any conditions that you must meet before they, they hear it, like, like before hearing Yeah, of course. It, it, if, they see your, if they see your communication is rubbish, of course, they, they will answer to you that we have seen. They will, they will not say it's rubbish. We have seen and we do not think there is any transgression. They will express an opinion. They are very, very independent. Right? They are extremely independent body. 
so far there has never been any allegation against them. Just like uh, we used to have the Privy Council, there was no allegations of biasness, nothing. I think the Privy Council has never had an occasion where uh, a recusal was made because they were upright. And even in the House of Lords, only in the case of Pinochet number two, the question of recusal was raised. But the judge, the Justice Hoffman, uh, like a typical English gentleman, he disclosed everything that he was involved in with Amnesty International. And that's how the second quorum was able to say he ought to have disqualified himself. So are there conditions that he has to meet before the UN working group decides to clear Yes. We, we feel we have met more than the condition imposed. Last week, how is the health of uh, Ratashi at this point of time? At this point, he, you know, he had, uh, apart from that stomach problem, uh, uh, he, he has been put on, on diet that are lesser in oil and, and, and things like that, so that there is no bleeding in his, uh, uh, of his ulcer. His ulcer still is there. You know, once you have an ulcer, you'll always have an ulcer. Huh? But he's being monitored. Uh, his blood pressure is being monitored constantly. He has got issues with his, I'm not sure whether it is right or left knee, you remember he had uh, an operation done uh, where certain certain part of his muscles were removed because there was too much pain, uh, which means uh, even before he went to the prison, he can't play football, for instance, because because the knee can rotate. The X and uh, the the X the axis <coughs> muscle, one of them were removed. So he has got a, a, a excruciating pain, which requires him to go for uh, what do you call it. Uh, physiotherapy. And see, what would um, <coughs> stop you from, from saying that uh, the procedure should exhaust these options at the review stage first? Ah, uh, okay. As you know, review, review is not a process that is as of right. Your right is appeal. We have exhausted appeal. Same thing with Lula and all that. They have exhausted their right. So, exhaustion of domestic remedies has been done. This is a mere review vis-a-vis -vis uh, our, our letter to, uh, to the working group. Who is the jurist on the Malaysian jurist on the board? Oh, you want to, to, know, to know? I don't know. Well, you can actually find out. You can, you can actually check on the website. Uh, I don't know whether she wants me to announce it. I do not know her, to be very honest. Uh, she's an Indian lady from Malaysia, okay? supposed to be extremely eminent. And there are, there are people from New Zealand, uh, highly, highly qualified. Uh, people from Ukraine, uh, there's one lady from Ukraine. Uh, Ecuador is the chairman, uh, is a lady. Uh, then there's uh, two others. It's advisory, but because you are a member of the United Nations, you 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 uh, you abide by the advice of a United Nations body. You remember uh, when when I was sitting uh, uh, representing Malaysia in Aisha. Aisha is uh, ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission of Human Rights. We had a visit by the High Commissioner of Human Rights of the United Nations. She came in, it was a lady from Sri Lanka, she was, she was a chairman. And she came in and gave advisory uh, 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 opinion uh, to this group of, of us who constitute ASEAN members. And we, we abided by her, by her opinion. We, I didn't say seven member. I requested uh -huh. for seven minimum five, but we now learn that there's only six members balance that have not heard the first time. So only six members are qualified. So chances are it could be five. We are all right with five, provided they are from the federal court, permanent 
permanent judges of the federal court and not being taken by the, from the court of appeal to sit on an ad hoc basis. That I will object. And the uh, submission filed? Have you filed your submission? Or? Uh, we have asked for extension until Monday. Until Monday? It's yeah, the, uh, until this Monday, simply because yesterday <coughs> and day before yesterday we were busy filing two election petitions. Mm -hmm. Because the last day were yesterday and day before. Yeah? They haven't replied, but they haven't replied. Okay, although we have we have uh, written in when was that Monday? Yeah, earlier uh, two days ago we have written in. But normally this is not an issue. If you don't uh, extend and then you say we now we don't want to extend, it will be another breach of human rights. Okay, so this is not an issue at all. No, no, no. If we give on Monday, Monday is what they say. Monday is the 9th. They got 10 days to read. Right? They got 10 days to read. Going by the uh, judgment in the Dato Sri Najib's case, uh, the CJ said 10 days are more than enough to read. Right? We have got. Uh, uh, tea and uh, some drinks. Please enjoy yourself. Oh, to do it again. <laughs> okay. The cat is All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. These are the. All right. Now I I can show you this thing so that you can zoom in. You can see the title. <laughs> ah, all right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, now the second letter, short, short, yeah. yeah. I take 30 seconds to tell you. This morning we were pleasantly surprised because uh, Datu Sri Najib was supposed to give evidence. I have, we have provided the written statement of the witness of Datu Sri Najib yesterday to the prosecution. And uh, today the prosecution announced that they were exercising under Section 254 to offer no further evidence. I suspect the statement by Datuk Sri Najib was very clear that uh, Tan Sri Sharil was not guilty at all because he spent his own money in Johor Bahru uh, for political and welfare purposes and according to Datuk Sri Najib in his statement that uh, Tan Sri Sharil is one of the most honest person he has ever come across. He has no doubt if, the, if Tan Sri Sharil required uh, the replacement of that money, he had no doubt that it was true. And that's why he gave it to him. Okay? Thank you very much. The what? Is a witness statement. A witness statement that has been given to the prosecution. So it is it is on record.